A Lone Ranger image, this picture that we can do everything alone, is a myth. A fierce insistence on the life of independence when we don't need anyone else's help or advice has robbed us and the world around us of a richer and fuller life. Our walls of privacy to keep everyone out of our business has limited how far and how high we can go in life. God created us to be interdependent. We need one another in life. We're smarter and stronger together more than we could ever be alone. Well, praise God. Welcome, everyone, to Open Arms Community Church. We're excited that you're here today. If you want to open up your programs to the outline of today's discussion, uh, we are starting a new series called No Lone Rangers. How many uh, had a chance to go out and see the new Lone Ranger movie? Anybody? Was it good? Yeah. It was? Awesome. Very cool. And, uh, you know, that's the, I don't know how familiar you are with the whole uh, Lone Ranger legend. Uh, of course, it's a myth, but it's, you know, the cowboy that goes out and fights the bad guys with his trusty sidekick, Tano. And that's interesting because no matter what version of the story, the old original version of the Lone Ranger or some of the newer versions, the interesting thing is that the, the name Lone Ranger would give us the impression that he's all by himself. But the fact is, is that that is a myth. It is not true, and it's not true not only about the legend of the Lone Ranger, but it's not true about life in general. In fact, notice in your outlines that the Lone Ranger image, that picture that we can do everything alone, is in fact a myth. Depending on what version you uh, w were introduced to of the Lone Ranger story, some may remember uh, the one version where, you know, as a child, his family was attacked and killed off, and uh, it was a tribe of Indians that ended up taking him in and raising him up into adulthood. And then later on, uh, whether you were introduced to that version or another version. Later on in his adult life, he became a Texas Ranger. He and his uh, brother and some fellow Texas Rangers were ambushed by the McCavendish gang, right? Butch Cavendish, I think his name was. And uh, they ended up killing off the Rangers except this uh, man. And then he was rescued by Tonto, who then the two of them go off and fight the bad guys. So it's interesting that while he's called the Lone Ranger, He's not alone, right? He needed help. He needed support. He needed encouragement. He needed accountability. And he found that, depending on what story you have listened to and read, uh, he found that at least in nothing less than his sidekick Tonto, but also in some stories, a community, a tribe of Indians to assist him, to mature him, and to help him uh, move forward in life. And so you and I, in our day and time, we're used to seeing all of these hero stories, right? Whether it's the Lone Ranger or Superman or uh, Batman or whatever, right now, if you follow any of these um, modern movies and storytellings, you're going to find that a lot of them are all solo acts, okay? It's all these guys, these superheroes who go in, they fight the bad guys all by themselves, they kick butt, they save the world, and sometimes get the girl, right? And on and on the story goes. And it doesn't matter which version right now, uh, what superhero you want to talk about, this is the kind of the, uh, the idea behind all of them. Batman, the late, last Batman series, he was on his own. Uh, if you look, it was the same thing with Superman, Iron Man, you know, all these superhero stories. And it places within us this picture. It creates within us this idea that if we're really a, a hero type person, if we're going to be strong and tough, then we need to be able to do that all by ourselves. And I want you to understand that that is not how God created things to operate. And in fact, it's the exact opposite that when you and I try to do things on our own, more times than not, we're going to fall short. More times than not, things will not work out. Because the truth is, is life is bigger than we are, okay? This world is bigger than we are as an individual, okay? And so a lot of times we end up, for a number of reasons, trying to go through life, keeping up the walls of privacy and, and just kind of being all by ourselves, being able to face life, do what we want, how we want, when we want, right? Not having people sticking their nose in our business, not being inconvenienced by someone interfering with our business. Does this sound right? 
But in the process, everything we do, we do alone. We go through our problems by ourselves and frequently are overcome again and again and again, right? And we go through our joys alone. And we find ourselves not feeling the fullness of that joyful experience. We find ourselves enjoying that moment, but then sitting there feeling still kind of empty because there's nobody we're sharing it with. And that is not how life is meant to be lived. And I know from personal experience, you know, I spent the first 10 years of my Christian journey battling sexual temptation and failing time and time again. Why? Because I kept that area of my life private and to myself. It was something I held close. I played my cards close to the chest, wouldn't let people in, wouldn't let them know what I was struggling with, wouldn't let them know uh, what it was that was causing me to flounder. And as a result, time and time again, I would try to do well, but then bam, I would fa fail and fall short, okay? And you know why, why did it happen that way? Well, it happened for a number of reasons. I put up walls of privacy. I put up the Lone Ranger uh, you know, image where I was strong and I could do it on my own. Well, guess what? That was a lie. And not only was I deceiving other people, but I was deceiving myself and spent 10 years failing day after day, week after week, month after month. And it was a horrible, horrible experience because not only did it cause problems externally in other relationships, in my work and stuff like that, but it caused problems internally. It made me feel bad. It made me feel wrong, okay? And you walk around with this conscience of constantly, you know, being aware that you're messing up, you're doing it wrong. And so I needed community. I needed people who could see through all the little blinders that I would put up and see me for who I was, love me, accept me, support me, encourage me, and hold me accountable. And guess what? That's exactly what I did, is when life came crashing down around my ears, I went and had a decision to make, and that was I could continue to try to do this on my own and fail even worse, okay? Life had already fallen apart. Do I want it completely destroyed? That was my choice. Or I could say, you know what? I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to get people involved, and I'm not going to face these things alone anymore. I'm going to have the strength and the support and the prayer support and the help of other people. And you know what? That was the way that I found victory, is by having people in my life to hold me accountable, to pray with me, and not only share with my struggles, but also my victories. They were there to say, awesome, and to applaud the, the successes and to be there to see me move forward, okay? And in fact, interestingly, last year, uh, we went to Promise Keepers as a group of men, and while we were there, uh, I saw this guy walking in the dark, but I knew by the silhouette, tall, thin, he had... Uh, been an Ironman triathlete. And there was one of, my, one of the guys that I had uh, gone to to be one of my accountability partners, my friend, my mentor, and his name was Scott uh, Walters. And I was walking in the dark, and just the way the light, sh I saw the silhouette, and I knew that was him. So I went up and I said, Scott? And he looked and he goes, Mike? And we had an opportunity to go out in the hall, and I introduced him to a few of the guys who were with us. And you know what? That, that man played a, such a significant role in the success and the victory of not only me overcoming those issues, but who I am today. I'm not where I'm at today because I'm so great. I am where I am today because of the people that have been in community with me and helped me get to where I'm at today. Does that make sense? And the fact is, is that's how you and I are going to reach the highest heights that we can in life. That's how you and I will mature and grow and reach our fullest potential, is when other people are sharing life with us. So we need community. Notice, though, there are a couple things I want us to understand about community. The first is this, that community is not where you live. It is who you live with, okay? Community is doing life together. How many people live in a community, a neighborhood, and you don't know your neighbors. I mean, you know their name, but 
you don't have meals with them. You guys don't do bonfires together. You don't have each other over to watch movies. You don't go golfing together or you don't go hunting or fishing together. You don't go and mow each other's lawns or snow blow one another's driveways. I mean, do we have those kinds of neighbors? We have those neighbors, right? Where we know their name, we give them a wave, maybe, right? But they do their thing and we do ours. Well, guess what? It's not where you live. That's not your community. Your community is who you live with. Who are you doing life together with? That is community. And interestingly enough, I want you to recognize something from the story that I told, is that community, and this is a very important truth about community, community is who you live with, it's doing life together with people, but here's the other thing is that I took the initiative to establish community, okay? Notice in your outlines that community requires you to be intentional. It does not just fall on you, okay? So many people will sit back and they whine and they cry and they boo-hoo and have these little pity parties about how they're alone and how nobody's their friend and nobody does anything with them, right? Nobody's reaching out. Nobody's friendly. Well, listen, you have to be friendly. You can't sit there like this and think that people are going to be like, oh, give me a hug. Let's go play together. You're, you, look, you look like you just came out of a pickle factory. That's not friendly is it? So many times we, we pass the responsibility of making friends and building community on everybody else. You know, interestingly, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read the core values of the Lone Ranger. They're really, really interesting. But one of them is this. The Lone Ranger said, I believe that to have a friend, a man must be one. Okay? And so for those of us who are longing for friendship, longing for community, longing for that, that sense of belonging and, and friendship and fellowship and enjoying life together, guess what? Notice in your outlines that we cannot whine about being alone or wanting community, but be unwilling to do what it takes to have community. Because the fact is, is that community takes work. It is hard sometimes. There are rough patches, but in the end, they're worth it. So we need to stop blaming everybody else, quit passing the buck of responsibility and playing the victim card, and start being responsible for ourselves being friendly. Well, yeah, but what if I am friendly and they're not? What if I really try hard, but they still aren't friendly to me? You know, because sometimes there are people like that, right? Romans chapter 12, God tells us a very, very important thing about friendship and dealing with those people who are not so kind. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, friends, kill them with kindness, okay? Kill them with kindness. In fact, uh, a few years ago, there was an individual who got very offended at my wife and I because they thought that, um, well, his parent had passed away. The, the man's father had passed away. Well, I did not know that. I was out of town when it happened, and it wasn't in the newspaper because the father was from another uh, city. And I didn't know that the father had passed away. But, you know, long story short is because I didn't know, I did not show any kind of condolences to the family. I just was going about life like everything was normal because to my knowledge, it was. Well, in his mind, I blew him off. In his mind, I wasn't there. In his mind, I was offensive. And I started to notice that he was acting funny, and so I went over to ask him about it, and, well, it didn't go so hot. And uh, he was pretty upset. And then for the next year, his family wouldn't even talk to us. They wouldn't look at me. They would just turn the opposite direction. And you know what my wife and I did? We just loved on him. We would wave when we saw him. We would smile. 
we would greet them, even though they wouldn't greet us back, took them banana bread. Food always helps, right? Unless I'm cooking it and then look out. That's more of a curse than a blessing. But after a year, they started to warm up. After a year, they started to say hello. And now, now it's back to where they talk, they're sharing about what's going on with them and their kids, and so things are back to normal. But how many understand that that was a difficult season? I mean, you go a year of reaching out to someone and having them slap your hand away over and over and over again. Reaching out and showing kindness only to have them throw it back in your face. Very, very ugly, very hard to go through. But you know what? If we will stay consistent, if we will stay steady and stay true to the character of Christ, I'm not saying people will always come back around. I'm not saying they'll always love us. But what you and I have the responsibility to do is to love on them. Because more times than not, people will see that. They'll see the genuineness of it, the sincerity of it, and it will change their hearts. So notice here that we need to overcome evil with good, okay? So talking about community, you know, our fierce uh, insistence on the life of independence where nobody sticks their nose in our business, right? And we don't want anybody's help or advice. I want you to understand that that has robbed us and the world around us from a richer and fuller life. Because the fact is, is you and I, we cannot grow, we cannot mature, and we cannot become all that we were meant to be by ourselves. How many would acknowledge? We need teachers, don't we? We need people to share with us what we don't know. And to help us in those times when we are weak. Because as strong as some of us may be, we all have our weaknesses, don't we? We all have those areas where we struggle. We all have those issues that we just don't know all that we need to know in order to succeed. But there are people who do know. There are people who are strong in those areas. And those are the people that we need to be connecting with. We need those people to support us, to encourage us, to pray for us, to correct us, to hold us accountable, and to encourage us in our times of success. But our walls of privacy, friends, uh, that we have built up to keep everybody out of our business, they have limited how far and how high we can go in life, okay? They've limited us. Notice in your outlines that when we do life alone, we are weak, we are limited, and easily overcome. You know, when my wife and I, uh, before we got married, she and I had gotten engaged and then we ended up breaking off the engagement at first. And uh, her family was going through a bit of a crisis. Uh, her grandmother had died, so my father-in-law's mother had died. Now, my father-in-law had been an alcoholic for many, many years. And in the crisis of his mother dying, his daughter breaking it off with a perf you know, such a wonderful guy. Um, and then he was having some problems at work where there was some age discrimination lawsuits going on. He was a witness, and so they were putting a lot of pressure on him. And as a result, he ended up having this nervous breakdown. And I was there, and, and even though Marnie and I had broken up, Lyman and I started spending time together, and I led him to the Lord, and he became a follower of Jesus. And not long after that, he ended up uh, being able to break off this addiction to alcohol. And for years, he was plugged in with a church family. He stayed true to his faith and, and stayed away from the alcohol. But he ended up moving away, moved down south to North Carolina. And in the process, uh, the church that his wife had found and that she liked and wanted to attend wasn't something that resonated with him. It was too liberal. He didn't feel comfortable there. And so eventually, he just got disconnected. And you know what happened? Is that that almost a decade of walking alcohol-free, all of a sudden, the temptation weight got so heavy and there was nowhere, nobody else to help you know, support him and encourage him with that except us from 10 hours away. And he eventually caved in and one drink turned into two drinks and it turned into bottles. 
And to this day, he is now severely addicted to alcohol to the point that he, it may be affecting his ability to live much longer. And that's a very, very sad story, but that's how powerful community is in our lives, is that when we've got it there, we can be strong if we'll allow it to do its work in our life. But if we get disconnected, or if we throw up those walls of privacy and we hold one another back from speaking into our lives and being there for us, we end up putting ourselves in a place of great limitation and weakness to the point that we can be overcome again as we see demonstrated in the life of my father-in-law. Notice in your uh, outlines here, though, you know, a lot of times why we throw up these walls of privacy and we want to hold people back is we are defensive. We're defensive about our privacy because we don't want interference or accountability. And, uh, you know, haven't we all had somebody stick their nose in our business when we really didn't want them to? Tell us things we didn't want to hear? Yeah. And you know, when we were putting these, uh, this message together, Chris and Justin and myself, we were sitting down and going over this particular message, and uh, they both brought up these stories. So I just want to tell you that in advance, this is not a Chris or Justin bashing moment. But as we were sitting there discussing, Chris reminded me, he said, you know what, Mike, I did that with you. When Chris first came to faith in Christ, he had a problem. He was addicted to buying trucks. Okay, so he came to me and he said, Mike, he's driving this nice truck already. Mike, my truck's going to need work. And I saw this beautiful, sparkly Chevy Silverado. Is that right? And I said, Chris, don't do it. Don't be a fool. Stay out of debt. You've got this paid for. Put the money in to fix it. It'll cost you less in the long run. And uh, Chris didn't listen. Chris went off and the sparkly was too much for him to resist and he bought the truck. Now he's got a truck payment, but he's driving a new one. It's nice, right? But then there was something even prettier on another lot. His truck was nice, but this one was nicer. So he comes and he says, Mike, what do you think? I said, you're dumb. Don't do it. Don't do it. And Chris said, oh, I know, I know. And he drives away, but I could tell by the sulky shoulders that he was going to do it. And sure enough, he comes driving around with a newer truck. And you know what? There came a point where Chris moved away from just the trucks to then he wanted Mustangs, was it? He didn't come to me anymore. <laughs> he, he said, I already knew what the answer would be, and I didn't want to hear it. And so he would show up with a new vehicle and just pretend like nothing had happened, would never even acknowledge that he switched vehicles. Wouldn't talk to me about it. Why? We disconnect ourselves from community because we don't want people to interfere with our plans, right? But you know what? After how many vehicles? Too many, Too many vehicles. We won't even, let's see, two Mustangs, several trucks. Anyway, you know, how many understand that that'll come back to bite you over time? And those, that's pain that Chris will tell you. That's pain that could have been avoided, and it's pain that he and his wife have to live through now of paying off some of this stuff as they got themselves on track financially and are working hard to get out of that mess. But you know what? It's still lingering around. How many understand that could have been avoided? Not so differently, Justin reminded me of the story where he and his wife came to me, and they said, hey, Mike, there's this uh, house that we were looking at, and we were thinking of getting this house. And, and uh, you know, it's right here, and it's this many bedrooms, and so on and so forth. And I said, what's your financial situation, and what's your family situation? And when all was said and done, I said, no. I became the no man to all my friends. Don't do it, I said. Don't do it. I don't think it's a good idea for you. And Justin said, I don't like you. 
And you know, at first he was a little upset because I didn't tell him what he wanted to hear. And he said that he and Tanya left and they were still kind of like, you know what? Mike doesn't know what he's talking about. No, uh, we're going to go get that house anyways. But you know, they prayed about it, which is one of the things that I always tell people to do because it's really not what Mike has to say. But they prayed about it, and you know, they went to walk towards that bank and went to go and sign the papers. And, and on the inside, they said that the Holy Spirit convicted them and confirmed that this wasn't the right direction for them. And they listened. And not so differently when Chris was battling cigarette smoking. You know, he came and he asked for the accountability. He said, Mike, I can't do this by myself. I need your help. I need support. And so on a daily basis, I'm either texting or calling, asking him how he's doing. And he would swing by the house and I'd ask him. And there were many days where he had victory. And I'd be like, that's awesome. And then there were days where he had caved into the temptation. And you know, I didn't just ask him the questions. I didn't just say, Chris, how'd you do today? And if he said, oh, I failed, I I messed up. I didn't go, oh, well, that's too bad. I'll pray for you. I also said, give me the cigarettes and the lighter. And he would hand them over. I accumulated a nice collection of lighters. And my garbage man must have thought I took up a pretty big habit. But you know what? In the end, it didn't take that long. And Chris broke the addiction. Not because he's so strong, not because I'm so strong, but because we're stronger together. Does this make sense? We need one another. And those stories, I could tell you tons of stories about my own life, tons of stories about other people who have found strength in community, but that is the fact, friends. Notice in your outlines that God created us to be interdependent and we need one another in life so we are stronger and smarter together than we ever could be on our own. We share life together, friends. We share in our faith. We share our mission, that fighting of injustice. We share in one another's strengths. We share one another's struggles, our joys, our concerns, our trials, our resources, you name it. We share life together, okay? And if you and I look to Scripture, we see this community demonstrated beautifully in the early church, the first church. They modeled what community truly looks like in Acts chapter 2. Notice it says, all the believers devoted themselves. How many? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place. How many believers? All of them. All the believers. In one place. And they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And note that last statement, because we're going to address that in a second. I want you to notice here that what we see demonstrated by, in the Christian faith by the first church, by the first Christians, was that life was meant to be shared. Notice they shared everything, their time, their talents, their resources, right? Their faith, all of it. The mission was shared. They shared everything. So two things I want you to notice though, today, for today, because we're gonna spend the rest of these uh, three weeks, three more weeks, unpacking what you and I see in scripture regarding community and how we're to engage in it and how it strengthens us and makes life richer and fuller. But today, I want you to notice something about this particular model of Christian community. Number one is this, we are supposed to enjoy one another, okay? We talk a lot about how in community we're to share one another's burdens, right? And struggles and be there to support and help one another. But here's the other side of life, is we are actually to have fun together. And notice that it says that they shared everything. They had with great joy and generosity, right? 
They shared meals together. Notice that they enjoyed the goodwill of all the people, okay? So you and I are actually supposed to enjoy one another, not just be there in the times of trouble, but be there in the times of joy as well. The second thing I want you to notice from the scripture is that community has an open door. Clicks have closed doors. See, in community, did you notice that last statement that when these people were living in community and sharing life together, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved? You see, when you and I, you can tell whether we're living in community or living in a clique, because when it's in a clique, the numbers stay the same or go down. When we live in community and we're sharing life together, there's always somebody else being added to the number. Oh, hey, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, right? Or my friend wants to be introduced because they see the joy. They see the strength. They see the peace and the encouragement that comes by the time that we spend with one another. Many people feel lonely. They feel disconnected. They feel weak and afraid and overcome in life. And unfortunately, many of them think, I need the pastor. I need to talk to the pastor. You know, 90% of the problems that people want to meet me about in counseling would be completely resolved if they would just spend time with other Christians. See, we don't need the pastor. Notice in your outlines, people don't need just a pastor. They need a community of believers. Because you know, while I can give people counsel on a a number of different topics and subjects, how many would acknowledge and agree 100% that I don't know it all, right? And while I have personal experiences, not so enthusiastically, Josh, while I have personal experiences, I've not experienced it all. There are things that some of our brothers and sisters know that I don't know, and they have been places that I've never been, so they can speak into your life a lot more authoritatively and a lot more experientially than I could. Does that make sense? A lot of times, friends, it's, we don't need the pastor. We need our community. We need our church family to be there for one another, okay? The fact is, is that a pastor is limited, limited in knowledge, limited in experience, and how many also can understand that a pastor can only be in one place at one time helping one set of people. And in fact, it was only just several weeks ago that on a particular Friday, I had two people from our church going into surgery in two different cities, two hours away, and on top of that, I got a last-minute funeral call to do that Friday morning. Where am I going to be? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. right? Luckily, and praise God, we've got a wonderful church family, a wonderful community of faith that is there to support and encourage one another. And so there was assistance and there was help in all of those areas. But understand that as a group, friends, we can all be there for each other. All right? People don't have to be missed. People don't have to slip through the cracks. We can share life together. We can share in one another's strengths, one another's wisdom, resources, their confidence in faith. Okay? Romans 12 actually gives us God's command about community. Romans 12, look at it with me. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. And those are two separate things, by the way. Meeting people's needs is one thing, but being hospitable is another. If you want friends, you got to do more than meet needs. You've got to be hospitable. Does that make sense? We actually have to spend time together enjoying one another. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. 
Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now, this scripture paints a very full picture of the various aspects of community, love, honor, sharing, hospitality, helping, and even fun. And we're going to be unpacking these uh, particular verses of scripture again further down the road in this series. But while we regularly emphasize, again, people being there to help each other in their times of struggles and meeting of needs and sharing one another's burdens and trials, I want you to also notice that it said rejoice with those who rejoice. Do you see that? And unfortunately, many of us forget this command to rejoice with those who rejoice. In other words, to laugh. Rejoice includes the word joy. We are to enjoy one another and have fun together. And this is an aspect of Christian faith that oftentimes gets neglected because it seems unspiritual. Well, if we're going to be a spiritual Christian, we must go to church together, worship together, pray together, be there to pray when people are in needs and help one another with their needs, right? And all of that is true, but guess what? We're also supposed to laugh. We're also supposed to have cookouts on the, on the grill. We're also supposed to go boating and golfing and hunting together and fishing and biking and all of those wonderful things that you like to do. Bowling this coming Friday, right? Let's do things together and have fun together because that, friends, builds community. We need to be not just a friend in the bad times, but notice in your outlines, we need to be a friend for every season both the bad seasons and the good seasons. You know, it's great to have people there to share your life with you when all hell is breaking loose and things are a, a, a real uh, struggle. It's great to have people there to support and encourage you, but it's also great when they're there to share your successes and your victories, you know, where you aren't laughing by yourself, but actually have people to laugh with you. If you never have fun together, what happens is you will burn out. You will see these other people as nothing more than this, right? Always in need. You'll see them and you'll begin to think about the people around you as needs instead of friends, okay? How many know it's a much bigger joy helping a friend than it is helping just the needy. I mean, there's commandments and joy that comes in helping legitimate needs, but boy, when people are just always viewed as a need, it wears on you, doesn't it, over time? So friendship is what we're talking about. Community is what we're talking about. Are we connected friends in community or are we disconnected? Are we uh, a friend for every season? What kind of friend are we? Good season only? bad season only? What about trying to beat something alone? What are the issues that you and I are facing and going through? What are the questions that we've got? What are the things, the, the opportunities that lie before us? Are we going to try to make all of those on our own? I was recently approached last month about an opportunity for an investment. So, guess what? Mike doesn't know it all. And while I'm learning about investments, this is an area that is uh, beyond what I know and understand. So guess what I did? I called up and I emailed a bunch of my friends who have much more experience in those areas. And I sat down with them, I showed them the data that I had, and I got their counsel, I got their direction. How many know that's what I need in order to succeed? I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to reinvent the wheel and try to figure it out all on my own. That can be a very costly journey, right? So lean on one another. What is it that we're trying to face? It might be something like an addiction. It might be something like an opportunity in business or investment. Are you going to try to do that all by yourself? Are we afraid to be honest and real with our friends? Are we throwing up the walls of privacy? Are we unwilling to hear and accept correction on issues? I don't want, you know what, keep your nose out of my business, right? 
Are we allowing ourselves to be too busy to truly connect with other people? Are we so busy that when every time we get an opportunity, someone invites us, oh, I'd love to, but I can't, love to, but I can't, and believe me, I understand that. My schedule is pretty packed too. And I have to, you know, sometimes say yes and switch things around. Sometimes I need to cut back on some things, right? To make sure that we take the times to build that community. What about feeling alone and having no one to share our good or bad times with? Are we playing the victim card? Are we sitting back with our hands folding, waiting for everybody else to reach out to us? Or are we making the effort and being intentional and reaching out to make friends with others? We can enjoy life. We can enjoy it to the full. It can actually be fun, okay, and not miserable and hard. But we've got to make some steps, right? We've got to make some effort. I want you to imagine having people in your life that you can actually talk to, not only about the weather and the latest changes on your favorite football team, not only about the fish that got away or the buck that got away, but actually having friends where you can have those conversations about the things that really matter in life, and you guys can laugh together, and you can cry together. Imagine having that kind of community, that kind of friendship. People that are not fair-weather friends, but a friend for all seasons. So in order to uh, break this myth of the Lone Ranger, in order to tear down these walls of prophecy, over the next several weeks, we will be continuing to unpack what it means to be in community, what it means to share life together. But today I want to just emphasize the one major aspect that I think is missing big time in the church today, and that is sharing life together and enjoying one another, enjoying one another. So if we're going to do that, here's the application. We need to invite some people to do something fun. It's that simple. This week, I want you to think, who can we invite over? It might be a cookout. It might be to watch a movie. It might be to go bowling, okay? It might be to do God knows what. Make it fun, keep it clean, but make it fun, right? But it's that simple. Get together with some people and do something fun, do something enjoyable. Go on a hike, go on a bike ride. I don't know what it'll be, but do something. Break from the way you've been doing things so that you can experience something new. And one of the big things that we need to experience is friendship. It's community, it's the joy of sharing life with one another, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your many blessings in our life. God, we pray right now that you would help our church family and those that are listening by the internet or the DVDs. God, we pray that you would just speak into each of our hearts the people that we need to be connecting with, people to reach out to, and people to accept that are reaching out to us. Lord, we pray that you'll give us the, the strength and the courage to take the initiative, to be intentional and to reach out to people, to make connection. We pray that you would help each of us to be more than a fair weather friend, but to be there a friend for every season, the good times and the, ba and the bad times. We pray right now, Father, that in the course of this next week, you would bring to our mind some people to invite over, some people to get together with, to just have a good time, to just share some enjoyable moments together, something fun, something enjoyable. And Lord, we pray that we would be viewed not just as a spiritual people, not just as a people that love Jesus, but as a people who love people, as a people who are friendly, as a people who genuinely enjoy life and each other, and as a community that is fun to be with, a community that makes life richer and fuller. And God, we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.